All right, greetings everyone. It's a little after one o'clock, so let's get started. My name is Jerry Hahn from Purdue University Sirius. I'd like to welcome you to the July 22nd session of the Sirius Summer Security Seminar Series. We've been very pleased with the lineup we have in place, and we hope you'll benefit from hearing from the cybersecurity experts and practitioners we've assembled for you at these weekly seminars. These sessions would not be possible without the support of the members of the Sirius Strategic Partnership Program. To learn more about Sirius and the Sirius Strategic Partnership Program and how your organization may benefit, please contact info at During the presentation, please keep your line muted. If you have a question, please submit your question via the Q&A function. We'll also be monitoring the raise your hand function on the website. It's my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today. Sam Curry, Chief, Inf Chief Security Officer, is an IT security visionary with over 20 years of IT security industry experience. Sam served as a Chief Technology and Security Officer at Arbor Networks, where he was responsible for the development and implementation of Arbor's technology, security, and innovation roadmap. Previously, he spent more than seven years at RSA in a variety of senior management positions, including Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Technologist and Senior Vice President of Product Management and Product Marketing. Sam also has held senior roles at MicroStrategy, Computer Associates, and McAfee. In 2015, Sam proudly claimed his most prestigious award as the pillar of Sirius at one of our seminars, mm -hmm. or symposiums rather. Dr. Alon Kaufman, co-founder and CEO of Duality Technologies, has 20 years experience in the high-tech arena, commercializing data science technologies, leading industrial, leading industrial research and corporate innovation teams. Prior to founding Duality, he served as RSA's Global Director of Data Science, Research, and Innovation. In addition to his leadership experience, he is accomplished in the fields of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and how they interplay with security and privacy, with over 30 approved U.S. patents in these fields. He holds a Ph.D. in Computational Neuroscience and Machine Learning from the Hebrew University and an MBA from Tel Aviv University. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Sam Curry. Thanks, Jerry, and uh, hopefully today will be a good session for us. Uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman, Alon, and I have worked together in the past, uh, as you probably noticed from Jerry's introduction. And uh, one of our favorite topics, of course, is uh, both security and trust on the one hand and artificial intelligence and advanced computation on the other. So uh, uh, Alon, uh, good, good to be together again, even if we're thousands of miles apart for this, for this series. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Excellent. So um, here's the outline for today's talk. Um, and um, Jerry did, did mention raising your hand. Um, I can't see those as I'm sharing the slides here, but uh, do feel free to raise your hand and to submit questions because we're going to try to leave enough time at the end to answer those. Uh, but we're going to start with clarifying some language and in particular, the jargon around artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking what we meant by these terms. Hopefully this is uh, clarifying for the purposes of this talk what we mean. And of course, we're always open to feedback post facto if you have better definitions or approaches. But also privacy, uh, what that means and ethics and the language of uh, ethics versus legality and of course, uh, technical frameworks to do with all this. We'll talk about what the trust challenges that we worry about are and we came up with a taxonomy for describing them as well as answers in the same taxonomy for the types of solutions that can help. Um, and real future sort of like what, what is the extrapolation from this and some takeaways for everyone. Of course, this is about uh, trust and, and reconciling trust. Um, we call it ghost in the machine because what is emerging is intelligence, but how do we get um, trust in a connected world uh, that is more becoming more and more computationally advanced and, and how do we um, how do we reconcile that? How do we how do we trust in the how the data is how data that is collected is handled, how it's processed, and the uses it's put to? So hopefully uh, a good good food for thought for this for this audience. So let's start with terminology. Um, in particular, we're going to start with data science and machine learning and artificial intelligence. They're not really interchangeable. Um, in the Venn set, there's overlap, but uh, they are not the same thing. So specifically, what we mean is um, with data science, we mean um, analytics and pattern, especially at scale over large data sets um, and being able to make inferences. Uh, and this is fairly straightforward mathematically and uh, some great practical leaps in technology, especially over the last 10 years. Uh, now machine learning is, um, now most 
most uh, computation is um, is uh, deterministic. You're very clear with instructions that are to be followed in the sequences. And uh, while there are decision pathways, by and large, programs behave as they're told to behave. Uh, in the case of machine learning, though, they respond to environmental feedback, and it can alter the behavior of an application on the basis of that feedback. And many of the machine uh, learning techniques that have been around have been around for a very long time. It's just that we now have some very interesting data sets and applications to put it to. Artificial intelligence is different. It's related, but um, we mean two things here. The classic definition of artificial intelligence is, in Alan Turing's terminology, finding someone who can be with us and have a conversation with us, somebody or something, someone who for all intents and purposes is getting closer to human cognition, or if we're, if we're honest about it, there's a continuum of intelligence, perhaps more brilliant in some ways, but it is emulating to begin with human cognition and where that leads to. And the second is um, this continuum of cognition um, that may or may not have as an ultimate goal human cognition, but things that are becoming more self-aware and able to make rational cogent uh, inferences themselves or deductions, they may use data science and they may use machine learning, but they do not equal one another. And I think it's easy to say uh, that, that people have and will claim using these three in other terms, um, especially in marketing. In other words, people will say because AI or because machine learning. Um, so I think Let's take a look at some current status. I think data science is finding really meaningful phenomena. It's there. Um, is it a golden age right now, perhaps? Maybe, maybe things will continue to improve in what we find. Machine learning is mostly, as I said, old algorithms that are being unleashed and now producing meaningful results. And AI, unfortunately, in, as it is expressed in most marketing claims, um, is not really, I think, at the point where I would say it's productized in the sense that it's meant. Um, people use a changing middle, they'll say, uh, we have AI and, and imply that it has the intelligence of a human being, but nobody has yet passed the Turing challenge in a way that's been productized, let alone applied to fairly mundane problems like security. We do want to say as well, though, and Elon may reiterate this, that we believe that these technologies have tremendous potential, um, especially when dealing with security challenges and privacy challenges and some of the things that face us. Another concept I wanted to ensure uh, we addressed is the difference between first and second order chaos. And I think it's very important. Um, chaotic systems come in two flavors to use language that uh, uh, Harari uh, mentioned in Sapiens and others have since discussed. Um, essentially, first order chaos is natural systems. Um, IT deals with natural systems. Uh, it's about five nines. When you take an action, it has a predictable effect upon a system. They may be adapt to system, but they are not intelligently adapted. An example is the weather. A hurricane is a threat in a first order chaos system of weather. Um, COVID-19 is a, a threat in the first order chaos system of biology. But second order systems are different. They intelligently respond. The equivalent would be if that hurricane or you know, decided to change course based on how you take shelter. That's not how the weather behaves. Or if COVID-19 said, my host is going through an airport lower body temperature. Again, not how the virus uh, behaves. But security is second order chaos. What we do will engender a response from our opponents. And so to some extent, we will always be reactive. Now, we don't have to be. We can get useful predictions. But anything we find that says pattern helps find bad guy can ultimately fall afoul of two things. One, the bad guys don't have to know how you're doing it. They can just deal with the results and adapt their behavior, um, as, as, as for instance, you know, changing the course, their course, because of how you take shelter. And sometimes they can even, um, they can even be used to exploit. Uh, and something I've, I have referred to publicly is the mirror chess problem. If you have predictability in your responses, which is the goal of a lot of things we do in IT, then that can be used against you aggressively or as a tool. Uh, an example in security specifically is ransomware. When you run into ransomware, um, a lot of IT departments have a reimage the system. And uh, attackers know that if they're doing a more advanced attack, that these policies exist. And much like dropping a grenade on leaving a room, they will leave ransomware behind so that the IT department itself will wipe out forensics uh, data and evidence. Some warnings about machine learning. First of all, um, it can always overlearn. Um, it can take so much feedback in that small changes are very difficult to, for the machine learning to adapt to meaningfully. And so they can trail behind pattern changes and can often be tricked by humans or artificial intelligence when it does exist. Um, 
machine learning works best in first order chaos systems. I want to make that point. And um, it tends to work best when you have few variables, a lot of feedback, and slow changes in innovation by an opponent. In other words, some of the stuff that Alon and I used to deal with with fraud, um, it works very well with. It doesn't work well when you have a lot of variables, very little feedback, and rapid changes um, by adversaries. And so keep that in mind when you see claims about what machine learning can and can't do. It's most effective when applied to very narrow problems that in the aggregate can make a big difference on efficiency or output. So let's also define some, some terms that are perhaps uh, softer uh, rather than just the, the sort of harder mathematical ones. Let's look at ethics, privacy, and legality, and in particular, privacy frameworks. So we'll start with ethics. There are many ethical systems, and it's important when talking about whether something is good or evil or right or wrong that you're specific about what the ethical system you're talking about is. And I listed a few here. In religion, we can talk about proximity to divinity or to a, a holy source of authority. That is good, which is close to it. That which is far away is not good or evil or wrong. But there are other models like utilitarianism, uh, which is where is the most happiness for the um, and the most well-being for the most people. A another closely related one, but not quite the same, is negative consequentialism, which is what's the least bad outcome. And the, the usually right and wrong or good and evil in these systems is is a relative thing. So keep in mind, talks of discussion of good and evil, or right or wrong, are an ethical discussion. And if that is different, I'm going to jump to legality. The law is the law, period. The law is meant to obviously be ethical, but it doesn't have to be. So what is allowed or not allowed in a given jurisdiction or sovereignty can be perhaps draconian, perhaps unaligned with ethics. The ideal is that the two, of course, are in lockstep with an agreed upon ethical framework in a society. But then there's a third term, which is this notion of a technical privacy framework. In other words, does the way we think about technology and privacy, does it match? And we're going to provide a technical framework uh, very shortly here um, to, to, to discuss this. Um, does it, in fact, match up with the kinds of laws you write? Do the laws you write have any meaning on how the technology behaves? And can you express good and evil in your privacy technology framework? And so these are orthogonal to one another. Think of them as an X, Y, and Z axis. What we want to do is to satisfy all of them with the system as we go forward. This is very important, and we will get to that. So if you get it right, then you can frame conversations well, you can focus on, on uh, uh, of course, you want alignment to, to work, but there's room for debate in each of these. And calling them out says we need to think about each as we discuss how to reconcile trust um, with uh, a connected world and specifically with AI. So here's the privacy uh, framework that I had promised. So for those of you that remember Tinkertoy, um, think about a Tinkertoy. This is graph theory. Um, and uh, how things are connected. This is the heart of many data structures, uh, a lot of what Facebook does or Google does. It is that there are objects arrayed as, you can think of them as nodes or, con nodes or connectors in a, tech in, in, in a Tinker Toy framework, and the rods represent relationships or context or connections among those. So you could think of family members as each being a node, and the rods, different colors, represent different types of relationships or strengths of relationship. And you can expand to friends and colleagues and strangers and think of LinkedIn, the degrees of separation. And so to keep this in mind and imagine for a moment, that there is an ultimate graph, one that represents all the relationships of things in the universe to one another. And we may not be able to directly measure that. It's constantly being updated and changing. It is very, very detailed. It would take a lot of memory. Maybe we will one day. But where we're going is those who have the closest model to that in, 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 in technical terms have a very useful and mineable um, uh, set of data. Um, so having a model that is very close to that ultimate graph, graph or enough that you can infer other information gives you power economically, politically, and even for th positive things like security. So you could say, because I understand your relationship to other things, I can see if it's really you doing the things you seem to be doing. And we're getting closer to a new way to authenticate when you have that kind of information. But you can tell when somebody's interested in purchasing something, a corporation with an RFP coming out, or perhaps a person is looking to buy something for their home. That's the time to hit them with a targeted ad. Politically, we can use this to find those who are sympathetic to our point of view and even to manipulate them. So the question of privacy here comes up. And by contrast, I usually think of security in a shorthand as the cost to break something. 
But I think of privacy as the cost to obtain information about those edges, so the qualities of the nodes, and what are the edges. In other words, if you are one of the nodes in this tinker toy, or perhaps you are a collection of nodes, um, how difficult and how expensive is it for somebody to obtain information about those? Do you own the edges that touch your node or a portion of them? Do you have a right to control who makes money off of them? And I actually did an article that you can you can look up um, on Bloomberg. I did an article on extending um, property rights to privacy using exactly this model. Um, just like land, do you have a right to determine what happens with your data? And it's not a foregone conclusion that you do. Um, we have not really explored it properly with a technical framework that, that legislators can absorb and use and make statements about, let alone look at the ethics around it. So is there an ethical uh, privacy principle about not eroding that cost? Is it if somebody collects data on you, then they shouldn't make it easier or cheaper to obtain information about you? What laws should we consider here, like my own privacy uh, property rights being extended, and do they apply at all? So. These are some of the questions that are before us now. I'm going to pass it over to Alon to continue the next phase of the conversation. And, and Alon, just tell me when you want me to change slides in this medium. Thank you, Sam. So uh, moving on to uh, up to what Sam defined as like the framework, we want to start to talk about real world challenges. And I, I think it's clear today in the world that data has become the biggest asset not only for uh, analysis and for research, but also for companies. And as we can all see, like the top leading, most valuable companies in the world are today data companies. And uh, like anything in the history of mankind, when something became so valuable and so precious, challenges, legal challenges, privacy, security challenges started to emerge. And today we can already talk about a, a, a broader concept, which we call trust. The digital trust challenges around this arising power of data. And we'll start off by trying to give you like a, a, a classification of the types of problems that we identified. It's by no means a full set of the problems, but it's definitely a subset that can uh, intrigue with hopefully a lot of thoughts. And then in the second part, we'll come and talk about solutions. So Sam, if we can move to the next slide. When we talk about trust challenges, Really divided, as Sam was saying, into like three areas: uh, malicious attacks, privacy leakage, and ethics. So malicious attacks will be all of these things that are illegal. So someone on purpose or uh, an entity or an organization is investing time or investing money to disrupt something. And here we'll talk about examples that are maybe more common, like adversarial AI and the model inversion attack and so on. But all of these are, there's an entity out there that is in, has a goal to disrupt something as in, and, and is inventing money and efforts to, to achieve it. The second type of family is around leakage, privacy leakage. So privacy for human beings can be our PII, our privacy, uh, private um, identifiable information, or healthcare information, or, and for organizations, it can be the organization's IP or business secrets. And there are places where this information leaks, not necessarily intentionally, not necessarily maliciously, but this information leaks and is not really maintained or controlled. So these are a whole family of privacy concerns. And the third is, of course, around the ethics and fairness, a much more complex um, Field to address, and we'll try and touch that. And if you like to simply, simplify this and bring it uh, to kind of a very common uh, example, we try to show, uh, do this analogy to a, a truck, a truck that collects money. And so a malicious attack would be, you know, people hanging, stopping the truck and basically robbing it with ammunition or hanging up them with guns and stealing the money. So that would be a malicious attack on this truck stopping it and stealing the money. Leakage would be, imagine this truck is driving through the, the, the town and it's full of money and just in the, when it turns, money just falls off. So unintentionally, money falls off. People are losing value, are losing their money. Others can pick it up or not, but these people are losing their money. And ethics and fairness would be in this kind of analogy, 
examples of, let's say, people that live close to the root of this truck may have better benefits. Uh, maybe the driver of this truck is, you know, is a, 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 they hiring dis disabled people, so there's something positive around the, the employment of it. Or who's liable to the activity of the truck and so on. So much more subtle kind of uh, notions but still are becoming a very, very interesting topic, not only academically in the space of machine learning, but also in the practical world. So I want to give you now in the next slide and in the next few slides, a few concrete examples to uh, these uh, texts. And, and Sam, you can just go down, thanks. So when we talk about malicious attacks, so this again, someone intentionally is investing time and money to, to steal some information to disrupt something, we have like uh, three classical models of, of attacks. Obviously there's more, but these I think are like the most um, straightforward ones. So the first one is basically tricking an AI or machine learning system by poisoning the input. This image uh, talks by itself, but basically let's say you have a system, a self-driving car system that uh, is uh, meant to identify uh, road, road signs, and someone can take the image that this camera uh, picks up and overlay and add to it some noise. So what will happen in this case, if you, of course, you have to design the noise very carefully, but what will happen in this case is that a, 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 um, an AI system or machine learning model will basically take this image uh, and instead of identifying it as a stop sign, like you can see at the top, if you add specific noise to it, it would misclassify this to be a yield sign, which of course, in terms of uh, actions of the car is very different and can cause, of course, uh, accidents or any kind of changes. So this is just one example how if you can poison the input to the model, you can cause um, outputs you didn't desire. And this is, of course, even without disrupting and kind of fiddling with the model itself, it's just impacting and changing the input. Two other types of attack, which are basically the same, we just differentiate between black box and white box attacks, are the ability to basically take a system, an AI system, and derive who or what entities were part of the training set to build it. So here are the two kinds of approaches, what's called a block back, block, sorry, a black box attack, which is without the ability to look in and see exactly the model. There's a setup here um, that basically was showing that you can train an AI model to help you identify if a specific example was part of the set that built it or wasn't. So let's just say you're building a setup and you want to learn if, if the person has HIV or if the person has cancer or something. Basically, after you have a model, in these kinds of attacks, you can derive the population that was part of building this model. So this is even without looking into the box, even without seeing the model, just losing, using the input output of it, you can derive which entities were part of the model. There's an alternative kind of attack, which is a white box attack, which basically allows you to look into the model. And, and this again, allows you to derive and understand who was part of the training. So imagine you can take an AI system, open it up and look into the model, a model at the end of the day, is just a matter of coefficients and parameters. And based on that, you can derive, again, the inputs that actually uh, built the model. You can see here using a CNN model. If you look at the network itself, you can even derive images of people that led to this kind of um, a model. So these are just three types. The, the, the idea here is that um, People have been designing and already have practical solutions and ways to take models or to disrupt them or to learn uh, who was part of building them. And of course, uh, this is like a, a, a more advanced, but in the family of classical cyber attacks. So if we go to the next slide, we can start to talk about leakage concerns. So leaking private information. Um, Today, of course, the world has GDPR in Europe and CCPA and many other jurisdictions in the States, which is all around protecting privacy. And typically, they define there something called PHI or PII or PCI, which is 
private information, private identifiable information, private healthcare information, private commercial information, and so on. Now, if you, even if you delete these fields that are related to what's called PII, you can still learn a lot about people. So the image on the top, some of you may be familiar with it. It's a work from a Facebook. Basically shows, and if you look at that, um, on the left, it's people that are not in relationship. On the right, it's people that are in relationship. The middle is day zero, so the, the time that this person became in a relationship with someone. They basically show that they can predict who's going to form a, a close relation or intimate relation with someone before that actually happens. So based on your, your, your behavior in Facebook and so on, they have an ability, and you can see a high correlation, to basically know ahead of time what you're going to do. So even without PII and even without anything very specific, Facebook even knows before you know that you're going to fall in love with someone or become in a relationship. And so um, trying to catch specific elements like IP addresses or credit card numbers or uh, zip codes and private information obviously falls if you look at the bigger kind of concept. And also at the, the picture at the bottom, you know, if I know to, if machine learning models know to identify emotions, identify sexual preferences, identify diet preferences, and so on, they have actually access to way, way more private information than what uh, the world relates to as the PII stuff. So even if you delete all these classical identifiers, these methods know uh, so much about you. And the leakage here is not necessarily something intentional. It's using the, the data and, and deriving types of information that we as human beings don't even know or have been derived from our information and can be used for good things or bad things or unintentional. So th this is all about leakage uh, of private information. Of course, in the business world, there's also uh, things like business secrets that can be derived similarly um, uh, from one of them. If we move to the next slide, uh, Sam, please. The third category is around ethics and fairness. Here, I'd just like to um, give you three examples of this topic. It's a huge topic. It's uh, really something that today in the world of machine learning, in the theoretical spaces and in the academic world is being studied a lot. And I kind of like just raise three types of examples. The first example is around testing. So we all know that if someone wants to do a medical test on us, if someone wants to do a, psych a psychology test on us or kind of a research, uh, they have to go through a, what's called an IRB, uh, Institutional Review Board. But when you do these things in the, in the digital world, when Amazon or the companies like this do A-B testing, we don't even know that we follow this testing. So uh, all these machine learning and AI models when they use the, our data, they're basically building models and doing tests and using our inputs and outputs in order to build and do their models. So this is a whole field that, um, you know, they can do it for good reasons, they can do it for bad reasons, but at the end of the day, we have no control over really what's being done with our data and where it's going. Another topic that has been discussed quite a lot is biases. So uh, those that are more familiar with the machine learning world, machine learning models are just as good as the data they have been fed. And there's a famous uh, quote, GIGO, which is, uh, which is uh, garbage in, garbage out. If you feel a model is garbage, then that garbage as well. And similarly, if you, feel, if you feed a model data that is biased, the model will become biased. So, you know, no, the, the model does the, the, the regular kind of machine learning training and does the algorithmic work, but the output of this can be basically a discriminating model just because the data we fed in to start off was uh, biased or discriminating. And this obviously um, happens very easily. We never really, or not easily, you can create an unbiased and representative data set, and, uh, and, and this leads to a lot of challenges and specifically around things like um, crime detection and, uh, and, uh, and um, 
putting people in jail and so on. And then the third aspect here is really the liability challenge. As we see more and more AI systems in the world uh, taking more and more uh, <coughs> decisions, the question is who will be liable to this? So if a self-driving car runs over someone, who is liable to this? The manufacturer, the, the developer of the model, the car owner, it's obviously an open question. And similarly, it could be, you know, in the healthcare space. An algorithm decided you need to go through an operation. Or the algorithm had a negative, a false negative in detecting something. So these things, of course, raise a lot of questions in the, in the space of ethics and liability. Now, Sam, if you look to the next slide, um, it may have sounded that some of these examples are a little bit theoretical, um, but these are real, real problems and challenges that today are impacting the world. And, and this is like, as weeks and days go by, this is becoming even more critical. Here are just four examples, uh, companies that are, have to do cut downs because of privacy concerns, medical imp uh, research is impacted because in this case, uh, Finnish uh, data could not be shared with the NIH, so a whole research on Alzheimer was stopped because of privacy concerns. And we, we at Duality deal a lot with financial fraud and financial crime, and because there's challenges to get a broad view on cross-industry worldwide view on what's happening, it's challenging to, to really stop the, the crime there. And, and there's many, many examples, and, and even just in the last month or two, you know, Apple is going to uh, limit the use of IDFA, which will may majorly impact the world of advertising. Uh, the Privacy Shield's uh, recent announcement in the EU uh, limits these things again and again. So without, obviously, there's good uh, aspects of the sharing data and there's bad aspects of it, or there's good aspects and, and positive and negative aspects of, of not doing these things, but it's becoming a real business concern today and really impacting the way companies and their day-to-day -day business operate. So I've described the problem space and tried to give some kind of concrete examples and uh, Sam, to you to start to give us some uh, pinker view of the view, view world. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, as, as Alon said, we decided to put this into a grid um, and the three categories uh, are columns here that Alon just walked through. Uh, the problem space, in essence, uh, the malicious adversary, the privacy concerns, and the fairness and ethics. And then we said, well, so we're dealing with AI in particular. Let's talk about the three stages, and these are the rows. When you collect the data, when you build that model, uh, which he, he described uh, to some degree, and when you productize it, the uses that you put it to. And so then we arrayed each of the different risks or threats um, here. Um, what happens on collection, uh, how, for instance, it, when it's maliciously poisoned or um, if you're inadvertently leaking data or re-identifying information, and, in, and fairness and ethics, right? What happens with collector bias and what happens with de jure bias? Uh, building a model, how is it actually behaving? You can be malicious, you can build intentionally the wrong model, um, but also the model itself can, can be used to infer P uh, privacy information. Um, and uh, you can have unconscious model or bias, which leads to real results for real people that even the person who built it is not aware of. And then, of course, what happens on consumption or on use? Uh, those who, who perhaps build adversarial AI or, or um, in the case of privacy, they inadvertently leak data and or the model itself uh, from the model or of the model. And then what are the consequences? The last thing that alone discussed. So as we go into the the, the, the second uh, portion of this presentation, we're going to look at the technologies that can be used um, to protect in this grid. And it, it starts uh, really with what are the classical solutions here? So what are, the, what are the methods we've been using perhaps in some cases for decades? How do we, how do we uh, what are the tools that we would pull off the shelf that we've all used and know about? Well, the first is um, trusted third parties. And this is not ideal. Uh, using a trusted third party because then you have to trust someone. The system becomes larger. Um, you have to trust the integrity of that someone. Um, and the liability issues still rise up. Um, sometimes there are regulatory issues or break-ins. Um, we just saw with Twitter interest, interesting uh, activity on the part of employees 
uh, and the tools that are available, it, trust even in the case of a verification is extremely difficult. And another one is anonymization, where uh, data is stripped of anything that is identifiable in theory. But what we found is that uh, de-anonymizing or re-identification is very, uh, very straightforward and in some cases trivial to do. So putting information back in to a, into a data set that you think has been um, uh, been stripped out. Uh, Alon said, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out. In this case, you didn't think you put it in, but it's still really inferable. And it's still something that can be uh, extrapolated or interpolated. And classic encryption. Um, so you can encrypt things. It doesn't work for all states of data. Um, it is particularly useful for data that is in transit um, or at rest, but not while it's being used. And that's what we're talking about, where most of this data is in use, in active use. There's a lot of active memory where it's being worked on, and classic encryption is not really strong enough. And so that leads us to a discussion of what some of the new methodologies are and, uh, and, and, and what we call PETs. Alon, do you want to lead that conversation? Sure, thank you. So, so really, in light of what Sam said, the, the classical ways that also, by the way, the regulations all relate to are, are really, in, in many cases, just not good enough. And there's a whole new emerging field called PETS, Privacy Enhancing Technologies, uh, that, that is emerging now and starting to provide solutions, of course, more uh, advanced solutions. Uh, we're going to talk today about four specific ones. Obviously, I, I can't go into much detail because of the time, but hope to really leave you with a few pointers for each of them. So the first one, is, Sam, if we can move to the next slide, differential privacy. Differential privacy is basically a framework that at the end of the day is all around solving that membership uh, attack that I mentioned. So what differential privacy basically says that if you learn a model, if you create some kind of a query or some kind of analysis on a subset of the, or, or on a sample set, and if you do the same process on a sample set with, while you're removing something, like in this case, without the green uh, uh, person, the output would be um, the same. So you could not be able to identify if a specific input was part of a data set that was used to train a model or not. And the way they do it, you can look at on the right of the slide, is basically you add some level of noise. And the idea here is that the probability to get an answer with that entity inside or without that entity is very, very small. And it's basically saying that there's a dial. The more noise you add, the more the probability to, to, to derive what was in the set is smaller. But obviously, the more noise you add, you impact the accuracy. So this whole concept of differential privacy, remember, is hiding who was part of the trading set, and it's a matter of a trade-off between accuracy and privacy, but it does allow you to start to talk about a privacy budget, how much money, how much accuracy should I pay in order to hide members of the model. So this is one family to, to start to deal with a membership attack. The next family, is around what's called federated learning. Um, the classical way of learning models is bring as much as possible data to the center, uh, crunch it, learn a model, and then use it. Obviously, sharing this data uh, can be tricky, as we mentioned. And here comes a concept called federated learning, which basically says, listen, let's do local learning on the edges the edges can be different telephones, the edges can be different uh, processors, the edges can be different uh, branches of a bank, but let's do the modeling on these edges and then share with the central entity only statistics of the model in order to improve it. So like a classical example where federated learning would work perfectly is you know, in all these applications on the model, mobile that they try and predict what you're typing, so obviously, if a model sits on my uh, uh, mobile phone, it can learn my typing habits, which of course also reflect English typing habits, and it can learn what I type, and then you can share this table of probabilities across many users and refine it. So this is a great example for where federated learning is very successful, uh, and it's typically successful when there's a lot of local learning. 
On the other hand, if I want to try and learn a model which is the probability of, you know, how many steps you do a day versus the chances to go heart attack, you can't do much learning on the local, and, and you have to bring a lot of more data to the center, and in that probability to learning is less uh, good. So in case of federated learning, it's all about what can you learn locally versus what you want to learn globally, but it starts to give you a set of tools to, to differentiate and control this. Um, moving on, um, so if you really want to say, listen, we have multiple parties that want to learn something together, you're starting to get into two more um, types of technologies. Uh, one is called secure multi-computation, uh, multi-party computation, this is MPC. This is already in this world of encryption. And basically the classical example here is that you have multiple parties that all want to calculate something together. No one wants to share its own secret, but together we are prepared to expose the answer between us. So the classical example will be, you have the green guy, the red lady, and the, the great child, and they want to calculate their average salary or the sum of their salaries. No one wants to disclose the salary, but together they're willing to understand what is the average salary. So a, a simple example would be here that each one would take its own salary, divide it up into three random numbers that match up to the number, like the guy with the eight would divide it randomly into five, two, and one. So if you add up these numbers, you obviously get eight. And then you dish out to every partner a part of your uh, number. No entity can ever really understand what the salary of the, the red guy is unless all parties really collaborate. And then each one, so the eight is divided, the 10 is divided among the players, the 12 is divided among the players. And then each one calculates the substance of the numbers they got. And because of the property that the sum of the salaries and the sum of the sums of these partial information is the same, uh, you can see that you can calculate the average salary together and no side really knows how much each uh, uh, person earns, but together you can calculate the sum. So this is a good example how you can start working together, deriving information without sharing anything, but at the same time you have to share uh, the computation between all players and all players know the answers. Going forward uh, to what's known as maybe the holy grail of um, data security is what's known as homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is a, a new type of encryption, or relatively new. It's been around for 10 years, but in the encryption space, that's relatively new. And what homomorphic encryption allows you is basically to apply computations to the data while it's encrypted and apply them accurately in a way that when you decrypt the answer of the computation, you get the right answer. So like if you just look at the little uh, picture on the left, if you take these A, B, C numbers and encrypt them with a homomorphic encryption scheme, you can apply computations to them in the encrypted space, in the ciphertext space. No one can derive what they are because they're encrypted. But when you return and you decrypt the answer of these computations, you basically get the real results. And there's a little example on the right. Uh, you have the slides, I won't go into it because of lack of time, uh, but that's like a, just a little kind of mathematical example. The, the idea here behind a morph encryption is that you can encrypt data, send it to a central entity that will never be able to see the raw data, but it can compute on it, it can build a machine learning model, it can do inference on it without ever seeing the data, but compute it accurately and then send back to the parties that are participating in the encrypted data the results that they can, they can decrypt it. And this is, I would say, the most advanced technique in this space and where most of the world is looking forward in terms of data security in use. With those, Sam, I'll, I'll move back to you and hopefully we can leave them at 10 minutes for some Q&A. Yep, I will, uh, I'll bring it in in the next five minutes. And uh, again, make sure that you raise your hand or submit questions because we will field some uh, at the end to, to the best of our ability. And uh, a very important point that Alon touched on is that this is not meant to be an exhaustive discussion of all the techniques, but rather illustrative. So we will also share these slides. You can look at the model on the previous slide in more depth in your own time. Feel free to contact us about it as well. 
and you can dive into some of the other other uh, things we're about to show as well. So this is the problem landscape we showed earlier, and now if we layer in, what are some of the techniques, the pets, the, the privacy enhancing technologies that can be used to address some of the areas in this grid? Um, we laid out a, a spectrum. Uh, so we, we talked about four of these, the uh, homomorphic encryption, federated learning, and differential privacy. Um, but we've also we've also realized that uh, there's other technologies out there, some of which are more mature, some are less mature. Um, for instance, we believe there's a whole space that's possible to advance around doing better tracing of logic and debugging. Uh, in the case of um, in the case of uh, asking the question, why after an accident, perhaps why did an AI driving a car make this set of choices? Um, I remember seeing some incidents about a year ago where people were concerned about what were the trade-offs ethically that would be made by an AI and how it had been trained. Um, of course, we never really know the answer to that. We can't do a debug on a human being who's had an accident. But there is an opportunity to do uh, to advance the science of understanding how machine learning and AIs come to certain conclusions and to certain effective behaviors in the real world. And so these are the, tech, the technologies, of course, Zalone said we're not going to go through all of them. But we've put them in a grid and we would love feedback if you think of others or if you think perhaps some of this applicability uh, needs to be moved around a little but you'll notice that most of these technologies appear in more than one place um, again it's not exhaustive it's illustrative but this is the array of things that we can do to try to get that trust back in a connected world where ai is becoming more and more prevalent so why is this important well Let's, let's imagine a, a world where we do this wrong and a world where we do it right. Well, if we, if we do it wrong, um, you, won't con you won't control and have autonomy over how you're perceived. Things like insurance rates could go up or simply uh, won't be available in some cases because AI will be determining who gets coverage and who doesn't. Prices for goods and services could vary on the basis of, of, of factors you don't understand. Why are you getting a different price for something from someone else? You could be manipulated politically or even disenfranchised, uh, which means no vote. Um, limited job opportunities, some of the, the, the disaster scenarios that we saw in the discussion of fairness and ethics. And you are effectively a stock for others to place bet on. You are the commodity in the system. You are the product in the system and capital is effectively moving around on the basis of your behavior, exploiting that, that graph that we, we uh, hypothesized earlier. Now, if we do this right, you can be in control of how you're perceived. Um, you, you can be paired fairly with an eminent domain for privacy data that relates to you, that you have certain rights there. Um, they won't exist just by default. We need to have ethical conversations about whether they should, and then legal ones are the things that will give it to you. You can determine how your data is used and you can improve your lot in life. You become the customer, not the product. Now, we're probably going to walk the line in between, but this is at the heart of discussions, as Alone mentioned, of uh, what Privacy Shield is meant to do and what some emerging privacy legislation is meant to do, uh, where it is being considered or has been enacted. So what are the takeaways? And um, ask yourself which of the following rows you fit into. Um, when you get off this presentation, there are some immediate things in the first column you should do. Are you an IT and security professional? If so, you should probably catalog projects that are using some of the technologies here and look at the problem landscape and say, are we using classic solutions or should we consider some of the pets? Um, short to medium term, define your technical model. See if you agree, build a core competency and uh, figure out what you, where you're going to try and tackle things or not. Long term, be a voice for privacy, which is a theme that will recur for everyone. Uh, in each of the rows. Policymakers, think in terms of technology, ethics, and policy, and um, ensure that the right policy model and ethical framework is, is there for your political orientation. But be open about it. Be open about what it is that you think is right or wrong, and when you think people have rights or don't here. And for executives, um, meet the technical staff. Make sure that they are addressing these things. You don't have to be the expert in it, but you need to make sure that it's on the consideration of your technical people and you bring in experts if and when you can. And for everyone, of course, be a champion for privacy. I think the opportunity exists now to use privacy as a differentiator. We see people being summoned to Capitol Hill and to testify before Congress in the United States and in other countries with their respective capitals uh, on the basis of how data is used. Uh, Facebook, for instance, has, has Mark Zuckerberg has had to go and uh, testify to Congress. There's an opportunity for people who are Building businesses off of data to be champions, it can be used correctly and it can be used in a way that respects rights and uh, 
and now's the chance to try to do that. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you. Alon would like to thank you. And Jerry, I think we're going to pass it back to you for any questions people have. That's great. Thank you, Sam and Alon. That was an excellent presentation discussion. I uh, have long said that a good teacher is someone who can take a complicated topic and make it easy enough for me to understand. So uh, for that, I thank you very much. It's a great discussion. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, we do have uh, a question in the queue, and so I'll, I'll remind folks if they uh, have questions, uh, probably the easiest way to get them uh, out is to, to put them in the uh, Q&A. But uh, the first question is um, uh, from, from Douglas, and, and it's, he mentions that a noted uh, American Taiwanese computer scientist, Kai Fu Li, claims that China and the U.S. are in a race to dominate AI. China has much less concerns about privacy uh, than the U.S. and therefore collect more and larger data sets for AI creation. Do you believe this to be true? And if so, how do we, the U.S., overcome? So um, I, I, I believe they have an edge. Yeah, I, I, it's there. We know the, the belief, uh, I think, in most Western uh, and pluralist democracies in the world was that uh, the technology would help us, um, that it doesn't have to be the case. Technology is independent of ethical systems for the most part, and it can be used to support any number of agendas. There is an advantage in being able to collect data, but I think that there's whole economies and there's uh, whole uses that uh, having a respect for privacy will open up. And this isn't just the U.S. versus China. I think it's a question of, of what are the privacy ethics globally how are they emerging as a whole and how are they perhaps regionalizing? There's a lot of people in Africa, in Europe, in Latin America, and pri the privacy discussion is going to happen there and happen distinctly there. So if you just say, hey, China is three times larger population wise or greater than the U.S. and it's just who has the bigger data sets, it's not a good outcome, but it's a much bigger discussion than that. Alone, what's your thinking? Um, I, I, I say... I'll try to answer this also, you know, extending it a little bit different and bring it to, uh, to, to this world of COVID. So, for example, in countries like China, that privacy was less a concern, I think it's clear that they had an edge. They could treat this disease, they could treat the pandemic, they could track people much, much easier, and hence they, it all seems like they could control it better. And people basically had walking around with an app, allowing them onto the buses or not, they based on their exposure. Now, obviously, that's like I would say the most severe kind of uh, uh, privacy, um, um, uh, looking into your privacy, and versus the Western world that is trying to really protect privacy but can't do the same thing. So I, I think they do have an edge, and part of their edge is because there's no uh, privacy concerns, but these types of technologies and, and this kind of map that Sam showed is exactly the solution how Western countries, again, we'll have to pay more. We'll have one hand, hand, one hand tied behind our backs, but there are abilities, there's all ways to do these things like privacy preserving contact tracing, like privacy preserving multi center research of COVID and so on that can get to the same results without compromising privacy. And I think the big challenge is not to try and uh, you know, uh, or, or I would say differently, to use our regulations, to use our privacy rules to protect us, but at the same time, come up with these technologies that can allow us to at least um, compete uh, on this, because obviously if you don't have security, uh, privacy concerns, you can uh, run much quicker. So it's, uh, I think th these topics are exactly the things that we have to keep in mind in order to be able to compete and, and at the same time protect our privacy. Great. Okay, I have, a, I have another question that's, that's come up. Uh, the question is, can we say that security is vendor and policies dependent? In, in which vendors and systems in the lower levels are more vulnerable due to the lack of high standards in advanced systems, plus the trust issues, et cetera? What do you think? Wow. Um, I think it's kind of a sweeping statement to say that it is vendor uh, dependent. Uh, vendors play a massive role in this, especially if you abdicate. If you if you say, I'm going to trust you, yes, no binary, and you either have the keys to the kingdom or you don't. 
ultimately, regardless of your relationship, say with a cloud provider or with a particular solution provider, you are responsible for and accountable for how data is used that your, your company or your organization is fortunate enough to have access to. So I, w I wouldn't uh, favor abdicating in that way. I think it's more complex. I think you can still put the controls in place. You can have the tough discussions. You can, you can, <laughs> there are technical ways you can do things like splitting keys, for instance, if you use something like Shamir's you know, key splitting algorithm or uh, secret sharing algorithm. Um, there are ways you can do things technically, but really it's about the whole system and to what degree you trust and you hand over control. Uh, I don't think we can just abdicate and say, hey, I've got, I, at the end, it's all this vendor or nothing. But um, you can do that. It, it, is a, it is a risk decision. Alone, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't have anything to add. I agree. Okay, that's, I think that's all the questions I see in the queue uh, at this point in time and no hands raised. So uh, in our last couple of minutes, I will, I will mention to everyone that these sessions are being recorded and that they'll uh, be able to view them uh, at your leisure at the Sirius website or the Sirius YouTube channel. We should have those up in, the, in a short order. And I wanna thank everybody for taking their time today to participate and um, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next seminar. Uh, I do have another question that's come in. Oh. And the question is, is the ghost in the machine the adversary? And you did not talk about <laughs> detection. <laughs> um, so uh, we did not talk about detection. Uh, the ghost in the machine, I think in this case, well, first of all, it's an illusion. I'll let you Google it. Um, but it is about the emerging spirit or the emerging intelligence that is coming by default in the world that we're building. And, um, and how much we trust it or don't trust it in the kind of function we want it to have in our society. Uh, also, it sounded like a cool name and it's a great name for an anime movie that we <laughs> like. So, uh, so I'll leave it at that. But as for detection, detection is much more, is, is, is yet another discussion. There is detection of malicious activity, detection of leakage. Um, we could probably add uh, a whole set of technology around not just tracing, but logging keeping records and then finding and reconciling when you have these things. But that's, that's a big subject. Yeah. Okay. No anything to add? All right. Well, thank you, okay. Jerry, and thanks to everyone okay. on the crowd. I do, I do have one additional question while okay. we have another minute or two left. Uh, the question is, who gets to decide what ethics are programmed in the AI? Government, people, engineers? Um, my flip answer would be, it should be us, but the answer is not obvious. And that's precisely why we have to start having this dialogue. Um, I recommend in the recording, go back and take a look at the takeaway slide a bit, because mm -hmm. if we don't decide, it will be done de facto, and it could end up dystopia. The, the only thing I would add here is that, yeah, obviously it's, it's us and the developers and the teams that will do the model. But the minute you go to a more clear framework, you basically can leave this to mathematics and statistics, which are less biased and, and more uh, objective. So if you're trying to see if there's a bias in the training set or not, there are statistical measures to do it. And, and it can become a much more um, deeper and accurate discussion than today. You could ask the same question today when people uh, judge these things who, who we have to decide. And now we can move it to a much more deeper and uh, objective measure. Uh, still, we have early stages and lots to go, but it is a potential to do way, way better than what's done today. Yeah, and I'd refer you as well to what Alon mentioned uh, in the presentation, IRBs. In medicine, in science, we do institutional reviews, right? And there are, there are boards whose job is to have oversight that is not present in most companies that are doing quick sprints and development of, of a new technology or a new model, right? So let's make sure that we bring the same diligence to this world. Well, with that, I think we're right at two o'clock and the person who asked that question gave you an amen on that answer. <laughs> so that, that sounds like a, a great closing statement. So again, uh, Sam and Alon, thank you so much for taking time to do this for us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week at our next uh, seminar a week from today. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.